Good morning. My name is Al Houghton, and welcome to The Word at Work. We're doing a Bible school with one specific goal, and that is to fully equip the church to walk with the Holy Spirit in the end times. Now, that's quite a goal, because walking with the Holy Spirit in the end times means that we are going to have to be prepared to fully represent Jesus in a little different mode than uh, most of us have grown up um, being comfortable with. And so I, I feel like asking you, what do you know about new wine? <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure there would be a variety of responses to that question. What do you know about new wine? Well, uh, let's see. I suspect we, we know that the Bible promises new wine and oil. Now, the real question is, what is the new wine? What does it look like? Uh, we know what new wine is a type and shadow of in Scripture. It's type and shadow of the next move of the Holy Spirit. So uh, if, if we were to ask, are we prepared for new wine? The, the question would more accurately be, do we feel like we're fully ready for the next move of the Holy Spirit? Now, what really makes this an interesting subject is the fact that God spoke to me about this <laughs> just a couple of days ago, as a matter of fact. So you talk about a hot man off the press. Oh, Bubba, we are looking at it today. So basically, I just might as well tell you straight out what God said. He said, I want you to teach on the new wine out of Revelation 19.15. And I said, uh, let's see, Revelation 19, I think, I think that's Jesus in the war mode. Um, but let me go look, Res Revelation 19, well, pick it up in verse 11. I mean, I was, I, I, my initial thought was, is there a reference to new wine <laughs> in that passage? I, if that's the passage I'm thinking of, I'm not sure I remember it. Well, it really, what, what does that show you? How many times we read over something and we, we go to what's comfortable. We think about what's comfortable, what we feel like we know. And then the parts we don't know, we just sort of think, well, Lord, you have to show me whatever that means. All right, here it is. Revelation 19. Um, well, I'll just jump to 15. I'm, I'm sure you catch the context. Now, out of his mouth, let's talk about Jesus. Well, I will back up to verse 11. Then I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Oh, my. Now, that, that, now, if new wine comes in that context, I mean, we know Jesus the Savior. We know the healer. We know the baptizer and the Holy Spirit. I mean, we know the miracle worker. We know, we know Jesus in a number of aspects. I mean, it's, it's not like uh, we don't know the Lord and have grown up our whole life in a restoration of the Holy Spirit, restoration of the gifts. I mean, restoration of the power. Well, all of a sudden, this highlights a different aspect of Jesus that most of us are not familiar that familiar with a little bit i saw heaven open behold a white horse he who sat on him was called faithful and true in righteousness he judges and makes war his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns he had a name written that no one knew except himself verse 13 he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of god now, now that's a different jesus he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Somebody has been swinging a sword. And it sounds like it might be him. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now, this is Jesus leading an army of people who obviously, I mean, if there's any wine in this at all, it's obvious that there's involved in it, and they're following him, and they're an army, and then are on the same kind of horse he is, for the same color, anyway. Verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, 
that with it he should strike the nations. Ooh, you mean to tell me, is God really going to make war against the nations? Well, we've got nations making war against other nations, don't we? Yeah, it looks like we've got some nations who stealthily made war against us in the last couple of years. <laughs> oh, my. At least there were people in those nations, and that's exactly what they were doing. And with it, that sword, he should strike the net. He himself will rule them. Now, rule's interesting word there is poimino, pastor. We, we translate that pastor. He will pastor them with a rod of iron. And that's a direct reference to Psalm 2, rod of iron, he himself, in Psalm 110, he himself treads the wine press, uh-oh, the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The wine press? Did you look that up? I looked it up. It's the word wine in there. It is specifically in there. Yeah, there's a new wine. And that new wine consists of two things. Fierceness. Oh, boy. Thumos. And wrath. Or gay. I mean, these are uh, the, the thumos. Is, it's like, okay, that word means like to boil water. And so all of a sudden, you know, water, uh, as it approaches, but it just suddenly comes to a boil, crosses over that temperature line. And so thumos uh, came to mean to smoke coming from the boiling of water and uh, the fire. And it meant the passion of suddenly boiling and reacting as if you were suddenly boiling. So what you have to do is you have to combine the thumos with the uh, orge, the wrath. And so it's suddenly a passionate manifestation of wrath and fierceness of his wrath. Now, that word, thumos, 18 times, only 18, that's not that many, 18 times in the New Testament, 10 in the book of Revelation. So this is a particular transition marking the book of Revelation, and it comes with a new wine that Jesus himself makes. Or lay now, the reason why I say makes, because I just read the last part of that verse, he himself. So what do you think he himself is emphasizing? He himself. Jesus is making this. Nobody else has got their fingers in it. This is made by the master himself. He himself treads the wine press. If he's treading the wine press, he's making the wine. This is wine that Jesus makes himself for this season. And you got to ask yourself, uh, is it needed? Well, apparently it's needed. I wonder why it's needed. Well, there's another question, but the fierceness and wrath of, oh my, here, oh, here, here's where it all came together. I've, I've been studying this for like three, the Lord gave me this like four days ago. Okay, I've been studying this for four days. One word at a time, Thumas, took a day to go through Thumas, took it again, did another day to go through Orge. I mean, you know, if you're going to trace them, uh, chase them down and go through the references and try to just percolate in, Lord, what are you saying here? And then yesterday, who yesterday, I'm still recovering from yesterday. Why? Well, to put it in Greek, pantocrator, that's why. Now, I know that probably didn't mean a thing to you. It just go, oh, what? What is a pantocrator? Well, it's a step above cosmocrator. How about that? You know, listen, some of these studies kick you all the way back to uh, 
when you were studying Greek in seminary, and I mean, you have to go back and you got to renew some of your Greek and chase down the roots and the references. And I mean, it's been a while since I've been in Kittle. Kittle's a 10 volume set, 10 volumes. You don't have any pages in Kittle, the average books near a, uh, 800 to 1,000 pages, 10 volumes of Kittle. It, it is the most extensive dictionary in Koine Greek that exists. I bought it while I was still in seminary. I've still got the books. Most of it now you can access by computer. But I'm telling you, the, today, the yesterday and today, I went back to the books. Now, that, <laughs> that's when you know it, this is a serious, when it drives you all the way back to the old school. Oh, man, I've got to look at this in the book. I just, it's not enough to read it on the computer. i got to percolate on this in the book because, God, you are shifting my thinking about the end times. You're shifting. And, you know, I, I had one great, well, I had several great teachers, but I was this one was just super in that he gave us a nugget of wisdom that's really been helpful. And he was a teacher of history and he was honest. He said, boys, I'm going to give you some wisdom. Now, most of you probably won't take it, but uh, I'm going to give it to you anyway. And now he said, concerning the book of Revelation, he said, everything my generation produced was wrong. <laughs> the majority of it, he said, not everything. The majority of it, he said, was wrong. Charts and graphs and he's coming here and coming in. He said, it was wrong. My recommendation to you, the book of Revelation is so prophetic and it's so unusual. Wait till you're in it before you try to interpret it, because that's probably the only way you're going to get uh, most of it right. Wait till you're in it. Well, I'll tell you the last two years has made one thing clear. <laughs> we are in the end times. We have entered the book of Revelation. The horses are out of the barn, some of them, if not all of them. And uh, we it started. I mean, it's on. The end times is on, representing the... Why? That's the reason why this Bible study school, Bible study, Bible school, this is one study after another. Somebody came up to me this week and said, you know what, uh, I'm looking forward to checking your, your YouTube thing out. But he said, when I got there, it was a little daunting. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you've got a hundred messages up there. <laughs> and he said, it looks like a little much. And I said, oh, if you think that's a little much, you just hang on for what's coming. Because I'll tell you, so, some of these one hours are going to be much more, so much you're going to spend all week thinking about it. And, oh, God, how do I survive this? Well, that's Panto Krator. Panto Krator is <laughs> one step beyond uh, Cosmo Krator. And Cosmo Krator appears in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, Kratos. Krator, there, there are four basic Greek words. Uh, some people consider five, uh, but primarily four for the power of God. And Kratos is dominion. That, that's your, your top level. When you hit Kratos, now you're talking dominion. You're talking about God himself in manifestation, his sovereignty, and suddenly, and now how in the world would you represent that? Because in, in an issue of God's sovereignty, none of that can start in us. All we can do is represent, and, and really, it's mostly like, uh, okay, God, do I have a part in this? You want me to say anything? I mean, it's one of those. Okay, if I have any part in this, it's simply to say what I hear the Holy Spirit. So how did Jesus train himself? He did not say anything but what he heard his father say it. He didn't do anything but what he saw his father do it. Now, I'll tell you, when you come to Kratos, that's pretty much the kind of training you need to represent the Lord 
in a season where he is coming to sovereignly demonstrate who he is, and he's coming for a purpose, he has been provoked to go there. He has been challenged to go there. Okay, now I'm sure everyone listening to me knows Cosmo Creator from Ephesians 6, and um, I'm going to read it to you. Because I, I want to give you a background in this. All right. Finally, my brethren, verse 10, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. All right. Rulers of the darkness of this age is Cosmo Crator, worldwide darkness. What would uh, worldwide darkness be? Well, uh, any country is trying to control the world, any religion that is uh, counterfeit, that would be a worldwide darkness. Now, when you back up to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, you have the very first appearance of Panto Crator, in the New Testament, and the only appearance outside of Revelation. It only appears 10 times, nine of them are in the book of Revelation. So Pantocrator is almost exclusively an issue of God being challenged to demonstrate he is the creator and the only Lord of the universe. He's the one true God, in other words, the Panto. I mean, everywhere, Krator, the ruler by right of creation. Everybody else is counterfeit. He is the only one, and he is challenged in the last days. And, and that's your issue of uh, the fierce, this wine, this new wine, that is the fierceness of his wrath. Okay, now I, I want you to see it where it first appears. And it's an invitation for you and I. And this is foundational. And, and this, is, this is part of that growth in the Holy Spirit that we've talked about. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to pick it up in verse 15. Here it is. And what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk among them, I will be their God, they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Ah, so what's the call here? I, Through the blood of Christ, we have been given a gift of holiness. God has made us holy, and now we're called to walk in it, because if we will walk in that holiness, then God can bring us into this relationship out of which we walk the rest of our days, and here it is in verse 18. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Pantocrator the sovereign creator of the universe. I want to I want you to walk in an anointing with me. I want you to represent me as the sovereign only God, creator of the universe. And you're going to bump against counterfeits. You're going to bump against what's false. You can't handle the fire of my glory if you don't walk in holiness. But if you walk in holiness and the blood of Jesus covers you and you honor it with your choices, then I have a walk for you in the last days where you will fully represent me as I direct, as I dictate, as I choose. Now, I mean, here's the issue of the, the fire or the passion of his wrath. 
And one of the things that we know about God that, that comes out of Galatians chapter six, and it really is a, a uh, foundational principle. And this is just the way God is. And, and you, you recognize this from this verse because one verse out of Galatians 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. So when we sow to the spirit, what do we reap? We reap the life of the spirit. When we say yes to the Holy Spirit, we reap the benefit of walking in the Holy Spirit. We find ourselves in the right place at the right time for God's very best. I mean, that's the great thing about praying in the spirit. Praying in the spirit causes uh, the, the Lord to push you. You're, you're, you're praying about what's coming. You're, you're pulling the future out. The first thing, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 2 says, when you're praying in the spirit, you're praying mysteries, mysterion. Okay, it's about what's ahead. You haven't seen it yet. You haven't known it yet, but it's out there. And it's and you can pull it in. You know, I'm convinced some, some of these teachings that, the, that God is, that's where they're coming from. They're coming from praying in the spirit. And all of a sudden, then the Holy Spirit will pipe up and it'll say, and it's an interpretation. Some of us prayed yesterday or maybe today, maybe last week. I mean, you don't know. But here comes God saying, hey, go here, teach on that. I did not realize there was a new wine. In, in that verse, in, in that passage, Revelation 1915. I mean, I just, you know, well, there's Jesus. He's treading a wine press. Well, come to think of it, I guess the fruit of treading grapes in a wine press is your, whoa, okay. But this is a very unusual new wine. This is a new wine that as the passion of his wrath now, oh my, I'm, you know what, God, I'm not sure I really want to teach that. I'm not sure I really want to walk in that. That sounds a little dangerous to me. Um, and then I was thinking, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are we going to experience? What are you and I going to face from the enemy that might dictate a God response in this realm based on the fact that God responds judicially based on sowing and reaping. I mean, we know that. Be not deceived. I mean, it, it, but sowing and reaping was created for our benefit. Unfortunately, it works on the negative side. If you sow to the flesh, I mean, you'll flesh out. If you sow to the spirit, man, you're going to bless out. You're going to find yourself in the right place at the right time for God's very best. Well, all of a sudden, I went back and uh, I looked at this verse and I went, oh boy, here we go. Well, it is obvious from uh, Revelation chapter 12. Listen to this, 12, 12. Okay, here it is. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. What are you and I going to experience? That you, this verse tells us suddenly we're going to be faced with manifestations of adversarial wrath that are aimed at us as a church, as a believing people, at God himself, the God haters, the God mockers, they're going to rise up. And I mean, they're going to try to take nation. They, they are going to try to dictate, look at war. Nation will rise against nation. We read that. We're in the middle of it right now. It's happening. I mean, we got a war going on in Europe. There's a war been going on in in our own nation for two years. What it, at, the, at the core of it, what do you see? It looks like the enemy is raging. There is spewing wrath that's growing toward believers. 
in almost every nation. Now ask yourself, how in the God of the Bible, who is not mocked, who is sowing and reaping, is, is a principle. How is he going to answer? When wrath is thrown at his people, wrath by an enemy is thrown at his people, how will he respond? How long will you mercy somebody who's throwing nothing but wrath? It changes. You cross a line. You cross a boundary line when you go in there raging against God. I mean, look up. They rage against me. You can find it in the Bible. There are people who rage against God in the Bible. And how does God respond? I mean, he visits and he removes. I mean, he, you can provoke God to an equal wrath response that you are shooting at his people. Now, here's an unequal wrath response, who, who, the, showing the mercy of God. Uh, the, here's the thing about this issue. When you get into the fierceness, when you get into Pantocrator, you don't know how God's going to respond. You have to train yourself to, like Jesus. I'm not going to do anything I don't see God do. I'm not going to say anything I hear God say because he can give you a, a, a mercy dominion response, or he can give you a, a wrath response. I mean, that you don't know what he's going to do. Look, look at the apostle at Saul of Tarsus raging against God, killing Stephen, still breathing out threats and murder uh, in the, the next chapter in Acts. I mean, just boom, 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 boom. You, you've got that going on. And so seven, eight, nine, you've got, whoa, of Acts. You've got Saul of Tarsus raging uh, and it, bringing great wrath to the church. People are praying for him. And then all of a sudden, what's, what's God's response? Strikes him to his knees. He's blind. He can't see. Well, let me ask you, did God get his attention through a wrath response? Yeah, he certainly did. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, he's raging against God and, and killing believers, killed Stephen. We, we don't know how many people he killed. Here comes God, wham, he's blind for three days. His wrath brought a wrath response that put him on his knees. I mean, could have killed him, probably should have. He probably earned death, but he didn't get it. But he got a mercy wrath response. See, this does, here's the challenge of this new wine. It doesn't originate here. It, it doesn't come, it doesn't originate with us. We, God has to show us what he's going to do. And then we represent him. We speak it, we declare it, we do it. I mean, they, Peter and Paul, they had to learn to walk this way. Okay, Lord, what do you, you can imagine Paul uh, facing the, the false prophet, Elamus. Well, God, what do you want to do? You want to blind him like you blinded me? Yeah, we're going to do the same thing that I did to you. Okay. And Paul says it as redemptively as he possibly can. So, you know, he, he lays out the sin. And then he says, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And you're going to be blind for a season. God is mercying you to give you a season to repent. He could have killed you, but he just blinded you instead. See, that's the unwritten message there. And you can bank on the fact that Elam has got it. Oh, yeah. Well, who else got it? <laughs> the politician that Elam was trying to persuade to keep Paul out of going to this area. Oh, yeah. And and what did, how did the politician respond? He said, uh, here's your visa. Doors open. Church, you hear this. That is the new wine. That is Pantocrator. This is the God who rules the universe. Nobody pokes this bear because he pokes back. And, and he, can, 
He can mercy you and give you a ministry, but in the process, guess what? He'll show you how much you're going to have to suffer for him. <laughs> so I'm sure pa Paul was thinking many a day, gee, this would have been easier if he'd have just taken me out. I, oh my gosh. Probably would have been. So <laughs> you know, we're not talking about something that's easy. We are talking about something that is going to cost us the ultimate in obedience. To, and we just don't know. We really don't know. We have to be prepared for whatever it is. You have to be ready for it. Pantocrator. Oh, my. Now, the next nine Pantocrator are all in the book of Revelation. I want to give you enough just to show you that Pantocrator had, makes his own wine. And it's a new wine. And you get this straight. It's a new wine. Now, you know what that means. Well, most of us, we think of new wine. First thing we think of is, oh, yeah, you can't put new wine in. It. Yeah, exactly. We have to go through the process. I mean, if, if you really want to qualify for this, you're going to have to go through the process of becoming a new wine skin. And, and that in itself, we need to talk about. But Pantocrator, Revelation chapter 1, verse Seven and eight, behold, he is coming in the clouds. Every eye will see him. And also uh, those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, I, amen. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and is to come, the Pantocrator. There is no God besides me. I am the only true God who created your universe and you worship me and me only. And by the way, I'm going to demonstrate that. I'm going to demonstrate to every counterfeit God, you're not God at all. And how am I going to do it? Through the passion of my wrath. It's a new wine. It probably goes with the old wine. We're not throwing anything away of all the Holy Spirit we've received in this restoration since 1900. I mean, all we're doing is it's getting capped off. We're getting the completion. We're, we're getting the final uh, ball cap. We're, we're getting the final, you know, little square hat and a beanie graduation. That's what we're, 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 we're getting the final fullness of God. This is just the last piece of the puzzle and it comes and fits with all the rest of it. And, you know, and, and let's hope we can use what we're already familiar with. And But, you know, it's, obvi it's obvious. I mean, don't tell me that it's not obvious if you look at what's going on in our capital. It's obvious. This bear has been poked one too many times. Jesus is making the wine right now. And get ready, because he's going to manifest it. Oh, yeah. Panto Crator. All right, the next one is in, oh, whoa, Revelation chapter four. All right, now this, this we're going to have to take a few minutes with this context because this, this triggers a bunch of our inheritance. I mean, this, the second usage of Pentocrator in the book of Revelation, number three in the New Testament, three, is what kind of a number is three? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so three is a milestone number, and I'll tell you, there's a milestone explosion. I mean, this just happened to me this morning. First thing I got up, I came up here early this morning, and all of a sudden, I am walking through Pantor Crator again, just trying to percolate in this, trying to get a real feel for it. All of a sudden, I hit Revelation 4, and po, bo, 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 all this stuff goes off, and the inheritance just shoots out of here. Woo! After these things, I looked and behold, verse one, Revelation 4, 1, a, a door standing open in heaven. New, what is new wine? It's a door. You walk through it. You, you receive it from the Lord. And you take a sip and say, help me walk in this. That's the same thing we did when we received the Holy Spirit. I mean, I grew up in a church that believed all the gifts died with the last apostle. They call it cessation theology. 
when I found the Holy Spirit healed today, when I found gifts of the Spirit today, I said, well, man, that's a God I want to know. And I had to come and say, teach me, Lord, show me how. Bring me into this. So it was a new wine for me in those days. And I had to ask. And I mean, that's simply how, I, here I am, Lord, I see it. I, I didn't know there was a new wine in Revelation 19, 15, but I see it now. Okay, I want it. Because it's fullness. It represents fullness. Plus it triggers, oh boy, does it trigger some things right here. All right, after these things, I looked, behold, a door standing open in heaven. Church, you hear the word of the Lord. God says there's an open door. Do you have the courage to walk through it? Yeah, it's open right now. It's open. And so is the door open to you becoming a brand new wineskin. And you're probably a whole lot further along in that process than you even know. Ooh, I hope we have time to get to that today. After these things, I looked, behold, the door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Well, that's kind of the track we're on. God's showing us things that must take place. Yeehaw. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Okay, when the Holy Spirit first came in Acts 2, what did Peter preach? God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Kurios, judge of all the earth, Christos, savior of all the earth. He is judge and he is savior. Hallelujah. Well, here he is on the throne. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And oh, what does Psalm 110 verse one say? Peter quoted that in Acts 2. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. What is the issue of Pantocrator? It gives you the new wine, the manifest, to do that anywhere you go if God pulls the trigger. I mean, you, you and I are just along to be the representative. We have to wait for God. I mean, this is 100% his initiation, but he's chosen to use people and use us. And so we have to be open to it, receive it, and be ready to declare it. We're his voice. We're his hands. We're his words. We're his feet in the earth. Just like the disciples were. Here we are. We're going to, whoo, you talk about, when you represent Pantocrator, <laughs> no wonder nobody can touch the witnesses for three and a half years in Revelation 11. Why? Pantocrator has anointed them. You don't touch them until they finish their race. God is serious about this, church. And the door is open. That's what we read in verse one. The door is open. Hallelujah. The door is open to this. Verse three. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Oh, my. Now, circle verse five. Because we are about to hit Pantocrator. We're about to get there. But from the throne proceed. Now here, Jesus is ruling on his throne. He's been made to sit until his enemies are made his footstool. From the throne proceed lightnings. Okay, the, I looked at that this morning and, and the Lord said to me, Zechariah 10.1, ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain and he will give you lightnings. King James says bright clouds, but if you look it up in the Greek, it means lightning between the clouds. He will give you lightning. And what do we find out about Hannah? And she prophesied, hey, he will take you off the dunghill, set you among princes so that you can inherit the throne of glory. And then God will thunder against his enemies. And I mean, Samuel walked in that all his days. So, I want you to notice 
what is going from the throne. Probably answering prayer. It's going to support the church, the members of the church. And from the throne proceed lightnings, thunderings, and voices. So what is the voices? Well, the, the voices, you're, that takes you over to um, Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah 11, we, now why? Okay, now listen to the rest of verse 5. And from the throne proceed lightning, thunderings, and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So here is your activation of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And that is a direct reference to Isaiah chapter 11. So if you go back and read Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 4, then, I mean, we, we just read the parallel right here in Revelation. Here's what it says. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, Isaiah 11, 1 through 4. A branch shall grow out of his roots, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eye, nor decide by the hearing of his ear. See, things are not as they appear. They're not as they sound. I mean, you can't trust what you hear. You can't judge by what you hear. You can't necessarily judge by the way things appear. We have to, we have to train ourselves to let God do the judging and we simply be the expression. We say what we, it's the only safe place to walk. Oh man, that's, what's scary about this new wine? What's scary about this new wine is the, the place of obedience that it requires to be an expression of it. I mean, you and I, have to know that we know that we know. We have to have a witness in here. We've used our faith on our flesh. And please God, we have walked in the spirit. Now, we're, all the, now here's the good news. All the people in Hebrews 11 had that. I mean, every single one of them had that. And so as you and I say yes to the Holy Spirit, that's why a school of the Holy Spirit is so important. We're just simply learning day by day by day by day by day to say yes to the Holy Spirit. I mean, I got up early this morning. I'm in here saying yes to the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, now, do you see how Revelation 4, 5, on your way to Pantocrator, references Zechariah 10, 1, ask Give the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. He will give lightning. It accesses Hannah and your inheritance. Thunder. He will thunder against his enemies. Voices. He will give the authority and power to your voice, to the words that you speak. He will anoint your words with his authority. It, it, it'll be coming out of your mouth, but it'll, be, it'll have the throne of God behind it. And when Jesus spoke like that, everybody fell over. They couldn't stand, which is kind of nice to have if people want to kill you. <laughs> it's, it's a pleasant manifestation, to say the least. Well, here it is, voices. That's a direct shot because of the Holy Spirit in the verse. The seven manifestations of the Spirit and we have those seven manifestations here. And, and in verse four ends with your voice. What kind of authority is coming out of your voice? The authority of Jesus himself from the throne is coming out of your voice. Panto Krator. I mean, that's what's on the table. That's what's being offered. Verse three of uh, Isaiah 11, we'll finish this. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge with the sight of his eye, nor decide by the hearing of his ear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor, decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Now, here come those. Here's your voice. Here comes your words. And the breath of his lips, 
shall slay the wicked. All right, what is he saying? This new wine not only has the authority to raise the dead, it has the authority to terminate, it has the, it has the full measure of authority. You don't know till you get there and say what God wants you to say. Okay, let's, let's finish this. Now, verse six, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal in the midst of the throne. Around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like a calf, a living creature, the face like a man, third the face like a man, the fourth a living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, uh, crying, holy, 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 Lord God, panto crator, who was and is and is to come. What are they proclaiming? They are going, they don't rest day and night. They proclaim everywhere they go. There's only one God. His name is Jesus. He created the heavens and the earth. He is returning. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And they, from the throne, they carry the authority of Pantocrator to manifest through God's witnesses through the church. Church, that's us. What, what's saying, what we're finding out is Jesus is making the final wine that completes the age. And he's going to pour it out. And now the real question is, can you and I receive it? I mean, honestly, and, and we do know a few things from the New Testament, and maybe it's time to look at that right now, because I suspect we are a lot further along in that process than we realize. You do? I do. What, what do we know? And I think everybody knows it, so I, I don't have to spend a, a whole lot of time with this at all. Um, but uh, we, we probably at least should look at it. And it is in Matthew uh, chapter 9. And so probably that's a, a pretty good place to look at it. In Matthew chapter 9, and we find it in verses of, let's see, here we go, in verses 14 through 17. Then the disciples of John uh, came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often? Your disciples don't fast. Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away, and then they will fast. No one puts, here, here, here comes the new one. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do people put new wine ooh, into old wineskins. Or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Well, how many times do we find this in the New Testament? The answer is three. We find it in Mark chapter 2, uh, and we find it in Luke 5. All right, so, and it's all the same issue. You don't put new wine in old wineskins. Well, you know, you got to ask yourself, am I, are we really new wineskins? Are, are we ready for the passion of God's wrath um, to be added to the mix? Or are, are we still in Matthew 5, 38 and 39? You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Turn your cheek. Now, that, <laughs> that has been taken out of context so many times, but it pretty much rules it so much so that there is a measure of unsanctified mercy in the church today. There are two specific lines in Scripture where when, when they're crossed, you enter a no mercy zone. Deuteronomy 19 is one of them. The shedding of innocent blood crosses a line, 
and this line is in scripture, and it says that once you cross that line, it is no mercy, okay? I'm going to read you two, two verses, Deuteronomy 19, 12, and 13. Then the elders of the city shall send and bring him from there, deliver him over to the hand of the avenger of the blood, that he may, now that is a person who's killed, who's shed innocent blood. Your eye shall not, this verse 13, your eye shall not pity him. That means no mercy. Okay. Now, really, this is clear also over an issue in Deuteronomy chapter seven and verse one and two of idolatry. When there is idolatry, when the Lord your God delivers uh, those in idolatry over to you, you shall conquer them, utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Deuteronomy 7, 2, no mercy. It's a no mercy line. Idolatry is a no mercy line. Shedding innocent blood is a no mercy line. And if, if you want to read uh, Jesus' response, his no mercy response in Thyatira, uh, same issue. Okay, so it's Old Testament, it's New Testament. There's a no mercy line. And if the, the biggest concern about having a new wineskin is we, ha we have been steeped in mercy, 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 mercy for so long that many people um, are nicer than God. And that's the best way I can say it. Well, there are seven distinct, um, seven that go into making the new wineskin. So let's talk about that for a minute because maybe we're a lot further along in this. Maybe God's been making new wineskins out of us all along and maybe we're through the worst part of it. Now, wouldn't that be amazing if that was true, that we were uh, like 80% uh, of the way to be in a new wineskin already and didn't realize it. So it's step number one in making, uh, now, now remember an old wineskin is really crusty, dried wine, in that, so the first thing you have to do, you have to reach inside that wine skin and you have to pull it inside out because <laughs> that reveals the whole part of the wine skin where you know all the wine's been and all the crusty dried parts. All right, so that's step one you have to turn it inside out. Anybody feel like your world's been turned inside out in the last couple of years? <laughs> well, guess what? We, we have something in common with a process of renewing a wineskin. And step number two, now this is in the old days, okay? They didn't, they didn't have the nice equipment that we have today. So, so this is like from uh, early, early, early uh, Old Testament days, you know, coming into the New Testament, then that's when you need new wine for a new wineskin. So they, they would, what they had to do was grab a rock and they, the crusty parts, they would beat it with rocks to break up the crustiness. And so they had to, they were going to eventually have to scrape it off. But in step two, you would beat it with rocks and break up the crustiness so that in step three, you could scrape off the old crusty wine. And you would have to go back, and if you had a little leftover tough piece, you have to go back and beat it and break them all up until you could scrape it all off. And then in step three, uh, that, that, was, that was step three. You would scrape off the crusty residue. Step four, you would wash the wineskin. So you had to make sure that you got all the old crustiness off. And, and why? Because in step number five, step four is you're going to wash it with water. In step number five, you're going to immerse it in oil because it goes back into olive oil. Why? In order to regain its elasticity, it has to soak up the oil and that will uh, help it regain its elasticity. And see, leather is kind of a, leather comes from animals. It's sort of a a living thing. So it, it, there's uh, leather will regain its elasticity if you put it in the right kind of oil, if you treat it right. Hallelujah. All right. So you have to immerse it in oil. 
Now, isn't this an interesting process? Number one, you turn it inside out. Oh my gosh. Number two, you have to beat it with rocks and knock off all the crust. You know. And then you scrape it. Oh, that does not sound like fun, but you got to get off all the old one. And, and then number four, you wash it. You wash it and make sure. And number five, finally, then you're going to immerse it in oil and let it soak until it's just uh, regains its elasticity. Then you're going to pull it out and turn it, pull it out outside in again. And, and, and then you, you let it set for a while and uh, then it'll be ready. Ready. You, you got to give it a few weeks and it'll be ready for new wine. Hallelujah. So, you know, ask yourself this. Has this process, has there been an unintended part of this process you and I have walked through in the last couple of years? I mean, it, it, nothing has gone the way we thought it would go. And we're looking around and going, God, is this ever going to turn right side up? Well, answer yes, Lord, I'm, I'm going to come. I'm going to come. I'm going to give you a harvest. I'm going to restore. But I want to fill you to the full truth of the matter is you can't handle the new wine unless your old wine skin is treated. And I have to break all that crustiness. I have to scrape it off. I have to open you up to the fullness of my spirit. I almost have to pulverize you till there's not much left. So you're crying out for me. And here we are. I mean, many of us in the church, that's exactly what we feel like we've been through. This has been the most difficult season we've ever walked through in our life. The country we love so much has been under assault. I mean, have we seen the wrath of the enemy? Oh, man, have we ever? Have we ever? And we're seeing it in war. As, as all of a sudden, the pictures of war, they're coming on our television sets and you find 80 year old men just you know trying to get to the store and all of a sudden uh, a tank runs over them and, and you're sure they're dead but then the people passing by cry them out god save their life i mean you you just you see the evil of you see the wrath of the devil in what people do and it just grieves you so much here but then you think, okay, Lord, what's your response? Well, you, you respond with your own wrath on the enemy in Jesus' name. And are you getting us ready to be a voice for you? And it certainly looks like, because we know who you are. Well, I mean, we trace this all the way through, and oh my. It's obvious who you are. And when you get to Revelation 14, and maybe we'll finish up there today. Is this really a new wine? <laughs> and you know what? That, that really is uh, a great question. So listen to Revelation 14, 9 and 10. Okay. And then this is about Babylon. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone uh, in the beast worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, and he should be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. This is uh, in preparation for what's going on up at, you see the same thing uh, for Babylon, mystery Babylon, where the enemy uses uh, money like God uses the Holy Spirit. And so you have it both uh, with the Antichrist, and then you have it again with mystery Babylon. And you find out the wine, the wine of God's wrath has one purpose, Pantocrator. 
Hallelujah. God is coming to demonstrate he's the only God of the universe. And guess who he's chosen to speak for him? The church, you and I. And we have to be a new wineskin to handle this new wine. Woo, surrender, humility, and obedience shows, prepares you and I to show who God is. S-H-O-W. Surrender, H, humility, in humility, in obedience. And there it is. We show who God is. Hallelujah. Well, Lord, bless your people as only you can. I Part of this message is a little scary, I will admit. I just, oh, God, help us. Help us. Help us be a new wineskin. Help us carry the wine that will demonstrate and make your enemies your footstool. Lord, only you can prepare us for that. And since it's a goal of the school, we say do it. Do it with an outstretched arm. Do it with a mighty hand. And give us the grace to walk here as only you can in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, Lord bless you. Go to wordatwork.org and you will find some material that will help. We're committed. We're going after the fullness of the Holy Spirit to stand up and to understand it, to commit to it, and to stand up in it. And just to say, Lord, look, here we are. We're ready to be your witnesses in the last days. We want your fullness. So bring it forth as only you can. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Bless your people. Hallelujah. Well, it's obvious we're not done with, with uh, this subject. There's a bit more to find out about Panto Krator and uh, how this unfolds. The good news is it unfolds. <laughs> Jesus is committed to it. And as we go through each of those passages, it becomes really clear that God is going there. He said he would, uh, to Jesus, have a seat till I make your enemies your footstool. He's going to do it. Pantocrator is the process. Hallelujah. And it's great to, to understand it and be ready for it. And it gives you a peace about walking with the Lord and what's ahead. We don't understand it all, but we know this. God is good. He protects his people. I'll tell you, I never rejoiced so much as I did seeing that 80-year-old gentleman alive and getting out of a car that had been crushed by, by a tank. I mean, and you're, you're just like unpeeling a can. God had to save me. I mean, that's the only, there's no way. After what I saw that tank do, there is no way you live through that unless God was there to save you. Hallelujah. We serve the God who is Pantocrator. He rules in the universe and he's going to rule with us. And we are going to demonstrate his rule in the earth in the days ahead. I want to make sure I'm ready. I believe you do too. Hallelujah. I think the Holy Spirit has said, okay, I'm answering that prayer. I'm going to help you. I'm showing you what it's going to take to fully walk in the spirit. And I'm going to prepare you to walk there. That makes this worthwhile. Next week, same time, same place. See you here.